Eddy Road, we believe fleet management doesn't have to be problematic. It should be effortless, connected, and future ready for your heavy duty operation. With a reliable, accurate technology solution, you can elevate your fleet's performance, improve productivity across your business, monitor events as they happen, and reduce costs and downtime. Get on the road to better fleet management and safer, more productive operations. Go beyond the basics and visit eroad.com today. Welcome back to Loaded and Rolling. I'm Thomas Watson, trucking expert here at Freight Waves. And the topic for today, piggybacks on 18 wheels. That's right, folks. One of the big challenges with trucking is even though rates are low and it's more expensive, it turns out you could also be sued into oblivion. And so one of the recent trends I've been seeing, I want to talk about, and we're going to be bringing on an expert soon to give us some info about it, has been the rise in nuclear verdicts. Now, at first they came for the trucks and I said nothing. Then they came for the trailers. And then I said something because I'm paid to report on it. But then they came for the OEMs and well, I'm still saying something about it because it turns out that the trucking sector is having a major issue uh, being sued. And so one of the things we're going to talk about, we're going to bring on Matt Leffler, the armchair attorney. He knows a few things about law, much more than I do. He's been actually talking about this, writing about it, interviewing about it. And I thought, why not have him on the show so that way we can get some information from folks who know what it's like. You've been in the business for quite some time and what's going to happen to trucking. Matt, pleasure to have you on for folks who aren't familiar. Let's just dive in. Give us the intro. Hi, my name is Matthew Leffler. It's great to be here, Thomas. Thanks for having me on. I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing law since 2010. I am a guy who's been in the industry for a minute. My family has been in transportation. My dad's a roadway guy back in the 70s. I love this business and I watch what's happening to it with abated breath because we are seeing something rise that has never happened before. Verdicts that are hundreds of millions of dollars against trucking companies and manufacturers. These nuclear verdicts, as they're so called, it's a trend that is disturbing and causing rate increases for just about everybody in this business. And I'm, I really appreciate coming on today and kind of breaking down some of these bigger cases we've been watching. And I, I like the deep dive aspect. You know, when you're on radio and other stuff, sometimes you're very much constrained. But, you know, one of the big ones, at least with this podcast, you know, 26 minutes, is that uh, we can dive in. The first one I want to think about is let's start by going back. Uh, trucking has had nuclear verdicts. Uh, Schneider had back in June $47 million. Werner has $100 million that's going to go to the Texas Supreme Court. So let's dive into that part first, which is... Um, from the trucking space, tell us a little bit how we've got to this spot because it feels like out of nowhere, I'm just seeing like tons of zeros being thrown around. And when I started in 14, it really didn't feel that way. It's a real good question you bring up. And let me first begin by describing what these verdicts are called. So nuclear verdict is not a legal term. It's a term invented by the industry that describes anything that's over $10 million in verdicts from a jury or from some settlement. This is wrongful death cases. Somebody has usually passed away or has been critically injured. And what we see is the nature of medical care in our country. It is expensive to take care of anybody. And so when you have something catastrophic happen, when a wrongful death is involved, you're looking usually at 10 million or above just because of the nature of the costs that are involved. But we are watching something happening uh, that is very concerning for everybody. These, these verdicts are increasing exponentially. Juries are being more, uh, let's say, punishment oriented against the motor carriers. And we're seeing these trends of these, these verdicts of 10 million or $100 million continually rise at levels we had never seen before. I think the plaintiff attorneys now understand how our industry operates and they know how to penetrate the different players and then go up the food chain, not just the motor carrier, not just the equipment providers, the brokers, and maybe even someday the shippers. And it's a trend we need to be on top of to understand why things cost as much as they do, because this is 4% of your entire revenue at this point goes to your insurance premiums. And I think it's fascinating. Uh, you're talking about going up the food chain. And that's such a great point because that brings up $160 million against Daimler, large OEM. Think of the Cascadia, the ubiquitous Freightliner Cascadia. That is a verdict. We have Wabash, $462 million. And I think that one was a, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a drunk driver ran into the underguard of a stopped trailer. But these juries are uh, going after the companies who made it. Let's, let's talk about this escalation. Uh, do you think, first off, I guess, 
process is is just just a natural progression if i'm a plaintiff attorney and i find out this one play works so i'm just going to keep spamming it yeah, I think you're you're not wrong there. The way to look at this is motor carriers in this country are underinsured by and large. The number of motor carriers that carry the minimum insurance is seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That was established in nineteen eighty. It's never been adjusted. People have tried to adjust it over the years. Even if you pegged it to inflation, that number would be four or five million dollars of liability coverage. Most motor carriers don't have that. And so, if you're a plaintiff attorney and you're saying, "Well, who can I recover from?" Because when you're a plaintiff's lawyer, you cannot bring back the dead. I cannot do anything that's going to solve that problem. All I can do is go after somebody who has money. And so we look and say, who has the money? These cases, Wabash and Daimler are different than what we've seen historically. Generally speaking, all we see in litigation generally is negligence. It's a, it's a duty, it's a care, it's causation and a breach of that duty of care. And then ultimately some injuries happen. Product liability, strict liability is totally different. It doesn't ask about what the plaintiffs were doing other than the fact of was it an anticipated use. So that Wabash case is really interesting. That, that trailer was made in 2004, over 20 years ago. The accident happened in 2019. The motor carrier went bankrupt after they got sued. But to your point initially, the driver had a blood alcohol content above the legal limit. Him and the passenger did not have seatbelts on. They smashed into that rear impact guard at about 55 miles an hour. Now, the legal requirement for rear impact guards is to be able to protect up to 35 miles an hour. That's fairly recent. It used to be 30 miles an hour. So this is a new kind of paradigm. If the plaintiff attorney in the Wabash case are to be believed. All 5 million trailers on American highways right now are defective. That's not correct. That's not the reality of the situation, but that is what that case is instructing us. And so now as an industry, we have to pause and say, what is the path forward? What is the level of liability we can anticipate for moving freight across America? And I'm curious about if I'm Wabash, because this is this would send a big problem if I make anything, because it says then retroactively I could be attacked for something that I sold it, you know, 20 years ago. And it's that's their problem to maintain it. Um, is that something where this gets escalated? What happens when we see these judgments? Uh, does that typically mean that they're going to stick or does this mean we're going to have to keep watching it to see if it gets up to appellate courts or if it gets escalated somehow? Yeah, that's a great question. So number one, the, Missouri has a form of tort reform. We, we hear tort reform uh, all over the place. What that really means is that the legislative branch and the executive branch have passed a law, signed it into, into law that makes some way of limitations of liability. So in Missouri, they have a, a thing about punitive damages. Let's look at Wabash case specifically. There is $12 million awarded in compensatory damages. These are the damages that are to make you whole. This is to cover your pain and suffering, cover the loss of the life. And each family got $6 million. The punitive damages was $450 million. That's a lot of money. That's punishment damage. That's to say, Mr. or Mrs. Manufacturer, never again should you do this. In Missouri, that number will be absolutely rounded down. And the maximum it can be is five times the compensatory damages. So that number will come down like $60 million if the if the verdict stands. So at a very minimum, we know that number of $462 million is not standing. That will be modified over time. The question then becomes what happens on appeal? So Wadash has a big big battle in front of it. They need to show on the appellate level that they exercised reasonable care with what they built. They built it to the federal specifications of safety. They did what they were supposed to do. If Missouri's appellate courts look at that and say, yeah, you did enough for the, the jurisdiction for the feds, but for us, that's just not sufficient. Now we have a substantial problem. That could mean thousands, hundreds of thousands of trailers needing to have retrofits or be taken off the, the roads because these things were never anticipated to absorb a 55 mile an hour collision into the rear impact guard. But this is the world we live in. This is the, the path we see in front of us. And it, it kind of follows along with what we saw with the Daimler case and what they built. And so ultimately, manufacturers are going to be on uh, notice that maybe these jury verdicts are going to be impacting them far more than they ever anticipated. That introduces a little bit of game theory because I want to also talk about kind of the Werner case afterwards, how they're putting aside money. So you do have this theory. So if I'm the legal counsel, just hypothetically, if I push it to the appellate, it could be worse 
or it could be better. I'm gambling it, but then also if I settle and it gets rounded down to like a 60, 50 ish million dollars, is that something that like legal folks have to consider? Is there actually a real danger that you would like, I would assume just take it up the level. I'm totally right, but it could actually backfire. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I mean, this is the question of when you make decisions for litigation. If you decide to appeal, that is public. When that appellate court weighs in, that is going to impact everybody across the country. People will look at that and go, oh, maybe I should be more careful. A lot of people will just settle and say, look, I don't want to go through the protracted litigation. Let's have a quiet non-disclosure of the settlement agreement where we both agree we'll never talk about this again. So I think this is the, the challenge you have even going to trial to begin with. But the appellate courts, like for Werner specifically, they have no choice. They absolutely must exhaust every single remedy they have because that verdict is catastrophic to the industry. And so ultimately they have to fight those fights. And I think Wabash and Daimler will have allies in these fights, whether it's a U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the American Trucking Associations or other organizations, they will absolutely weigh in because these verdicts have deep and substantial impacts all throughout the supply chain. And I think that's a great point. You know, we think of like ATA, OIDA, we think of the dueling banjo battles between lobbying firms. And then it's really nice to have something where cats and dogs can all come together because it may mean the very dissolution of your industry. But let's look at Werner. Werner is an example of, I got to take it at the top. I'm forced to do it. Uh, we've seen they put aside money. They've been absorbing this cost just in case. Uh, tell us a little bit about this situation because the Texas Supreme Court, it has these ramifications. What happens if they win or they lose? And can it make it to the Supreme Supreme Court or is it stuck in the state level? Yeah, so let, let's talk about the facts of the Werner case first. The facts of the case are very clear. The driver for Werner is operating the commercial vehicle below the posted speed limit. The machinery, the truck, the trailer, there are no mechanical defects we are aware of. This driver is doing a load and in the opposite lane of traffic, a pickup truck loses control, crosses yards and yards of median, and then collides head on with the truck operated by Werner. In that catastrophic collision, I believe one child dies and one is significantly injured. And the question becomes, who's at fault? Who's at fault? And if, you're, if you've ever been on the highway and you're driving, you see another vehicle in the opposite lane, how fast can you react to that? Seconds, only seconds. But when it was all said and done, this case went to trial and it was the driver of the pickup truck was hit with 16% liability. The driver for Werner was hit with 14% liability and 70% of that liability, that hundred million dollar verdict goes against the trucking company. And the question becomes, what duty of care do you owe to the other side of traffic if you cannot anticipate what they do? This is the problem with for, for many commercial vehicle drivers is that you can't control what the people around you do. All you can do is try to safely react and, and safely operate your vehicle. So Werner appealed this case, obviously, and the appellate court said, uh, no, you're wrong. We think you're still responsible. And that number with interest is now over $130 million. The day we're waiting for is December 3rd of 2024, when it will be argued in front of the Texas Supreme Court. They will make the argument that this is not a liability that a trucking company ought to absorb. Even though it's catastrophic and tragic, this is not the fault of Werner. And when we hear that hearing and we hear the questions of the judges, we'll have a better understanding of where they might go. But this dies in Texas. There is no appeal to the United States Supreme Court. There's no other path. This is where it stops. When you're talking about negligence and product liability things, unless there's some federal question and there's no federal question as far as I'm aware, this is going to stay in the Texas Supreme Court. And that means if you're a motor carrier and you're operating in the state of Texas, you might be on the hook for when somebody else loses control, crosses the center line, and then smashes into you. And you're the one who has to bear that expense. That liability risk is catastrophic. It's completely absurd. And hopefully the Texas Supreme Court will look at this case, even though it's tragic and make the right decision, which is Werner ought not to be held liable. 
And I think that's because I, I came in trucking as well. I look at dash cams. I've managed fleets. It just, it blows my mind. It baffles me. So we're looking at this legal primordial soup because I'm thinking of the implications here. We've mentioned Missouri with tort reform. We've mentioned the Werner case is kind of centered around Texas right now. Is this something where in the next five to 10 years, as these ambulance chasing lawyers, plaintiffs and stuff are testing the waters, does that mean that we may have a very different legal landscape for even insurers and other stuff as this settles out through the legal process? Absolutely. It's never been easy to be an insurer. You're mitigating risk and understanding risk all across the country. Every state is different as to whether or not uh, some conduct is considered negligent and some conduct isn't considered negligent. But if I'm an insurer and I'm looking at the transportation industry, we have vehicles that are on average 21.6% of all commercial vehicles are are not DOT compliant, so they're not safe at any speed. You see under insurance with so many motor carriers. This is going to be a very dangerous place to operate. And I think if these verdicts stand, it's going to be insurers are going to increase the price of not just the, the, the coverage, but manufacturers will have to adjust the price of the assets. Maybe those trailers that were $35,000, now with the new rear impact guard that's super great, now you're talking about a 50, 60, 70,000 trailer. So this is a difficult challenge we face as an industry, and I think it's important that we, we highlight the differences we're seeing from the product liability side, like a Daimler and a Wabash, versus the traditional negligence we see on the motor cares and sometimes the brokers when you're, when you're suing the broker as well as, as the, the trucking company. Do you think this opens the door? If I was a clever legal group and I wanted to have an idea, I would purposely try to push cases in certain jurisdictions. Autonomous trucks is what I'm trying to get at. As we're seeing situations where the motor care itself, like in Werner, is being targeted, the maker, like Daimler's being targeted, even the trailer maker, does that mean that even in spite of the fact if we remove the drivers from the truck, is this something in, there's a potential that, you know, we're laying the groundwork to come after you and we no longer have driver infused vehicles. This is a great question. I mean, I am such a proponent of the, the autonomous vehicles, level four automation, which is remote operator, level five, which is remote uh, assistant. We've seen the FMCSA talk about this. The reality for autonomous trucks is that they will have the same kind of safety standards that we see, I would say, in a, in a nice sense, like the airline industry. You cannot have an autonomous truck when 20% of those vehicles are unsafe at any speed. So ultimately, you'll have two new ways of recovery. It'll be normal negligence against the motor carrier even if it's a, a non-human uh, operated motor carrier or uh, the product liability side, the person who designed that software and, and maintained that software. But I think this is going to encourage everybody to have much more dialed in onto the safety and compliance aspect. The, the Daimler case, let's use that one as an example. Um, in the Daimler case, same similar thing to, to what happened in Werner, another vehicle crossed the center line, the driver uh, heroically made a move and that move made them avoid the biggest part of the collision, but they rolled the cab. And as they rolled the cab, the seat that they were in shot up and the, the, the cab of the truck came and broke his neck and he paralyzed him. And so the, the litigation was against the initially the, the other driver who messed up, but then also against Daimler by saying, look, you have the technology to make seats that don't have this happen. Why didn't you force us to buy it? Because it was an upsell. And that's what the jury came back with that verdict of $160 million. It was uh, this idea that you should have put those safety things in no matter what. So if that's the, the new standard, then it's going to need retrofitting and a lot of other potential um, you know, warranty claims. But if you're talking about uh, a driver who's no longer in the cab, you've avoided some liability. So I think autonomous vehicles, if you can prove the safety case and you can prove the, the regulatory landscape is, is adjusting to that new normal, we will see a ton of motor cures make that adoption very rapidly, faster than I think most people realize once you can prove out that it, it's going to be safe and compliant. And it's kind of opens the door. I think if I'm an FMCSA administrator, I'm now between like three rocks and a hard place uh, because we have the recommended amount of insurance is still woefully inadequate. But one yeah. undercurring, I want to get your thoughts on this. A theme I keep hearing, and this is something that's sparking my interest, is we first went after the driver or we first went after the person who caused it. We couldn't get enough. So now we're going after you. Is that one of the things where I'm taking off the tinfoil now? Is it kind of an evolutionary process? Because if I'm looking to recover, is there so much malice or so much as I'm just having to go find ways to get that value for my client? 
I think, I mean, a couple of things I'll mention. So number one, this isn't driven by the plaintiff attorneys. Like we, we, lawyers can get bad reputations. We are really just fulfilling a need that's out there in the market. And in, in any type of injury cases, they're taking on what we call a contingent fee basis. We're not going to talk about the people who loan against these things, but essentially you pay nothing for the lawyer to help you for four or five years. And if you win, the lawyer takes a piece of this. But what lawyers have found, and defense attorneys are also just as, as, as depressed about about this. Um, there is not enough insurance available. So you come to me and I'll say, look, yeah, maybe we're at fault, but my liability policy is a million dollars and I'll give you the million bucks and we'll walk away. Or you can you know, bankrupt the motor care and move on. But no one has enough insurance. And so if you're trying to make the recovery for your client, like where else can you look? That's why we've seen the C.H. Robinson litigation for trying to bring in brokers. We saw a, a different outcome in the global trans case in the Seventh Circuit. So they're trying to find ways to recover because Congress is not going to act. Congress is not going to mandate higher insurance limits because both the ATA and OIDA agree we don't need to have more insurance limit. We don't need to have higher policies. And I was talking with an FMC administrator many uh, months ago about vehicle maintenance. And again, I, I always hearken back to this. 21.6% of all commercial vehicles on average will not satisfy a DOT inspection. They will fail. So we have vehicles that are not maintained properly, underinsured, and we twist our hands saying, oh, these plaintiff attorneys are just destroying us. No, this industry is fundamentally broken. We all know it. So ultimately, changes will have to be made gradually and hopefully quicker. But this is the long-term outlook of our, our industry is we are moving things at operationally below the operational cost of a truck to operate. So like they're unable to pay for their maintenance. And we're just waiting for more capacity to exit before markets can kind of rebound. And at the end of the day, it means the roads are probably not safer, as not safe as they ought to be. Oh, it reminds me, I, I'd spoken with a former administrator and the challenges, they just don't have the resources. You can only go no. through a small sliver of inspections each year. So I think that's, I guess that's the, the worst joke in the world. So here I am as a trucking company. I don't want to pay higher insurance premiums. I can't afford to cover things that cover me. But then when the accidents happen, we're going in a roundabout way by suing the truck I buy, by suing the trailer maker I buy. And now my insurance is still more expensive. It's just not mandated by the government. It may be like mandated by an insurance conglomerate who is like, I can't insure you anymore, like houses in Florida or California right now. Absolutely. And he's also means to American public, right? So like if you, someone cannot recover their medical bills in an accident because the, the carrier was underinsured, they went bankrupt or whatever, the American taxpayer pays for this. Like we're not turning people away and saying, hey, unfortunately, you have no health insurance that covers this and we have no uh, potential liability from a motor carrier because they're gone. So again, like we are in this really strange time in our history of transportation where we know there are fundamental problems. We know there's opportunities to get better. And we also know know that we live in the most distracted society that's ever been. I mean, people are on their phones as they drive, go on the highway, you see it every single day. And so maybe we see more technology within the cabs so that we can monitor the driver and monitor people outside the vehicle. Maybe individual passenger vehicles need to take some additional responsibility. But at the fundamental level, you must have higher insurance rates and you probably need more robust FMCSA enforcement. Because if the, if the, the baseline is 20% of all vehicles are unsafe. That's absurd. Imagine going to the grocery store and having five gallons of milk to choose from. And I say, hey, Thomas, I can't wait for you to buy one of these just so you know one of them is unsafe. You'd say, Matt, I choose not to buy any milk from you. And I'd say, unfortunately, that's not your choice. You have to buy one. And I'm not going to tell you which one is, is unsafe or not. It's just, it's a very strange situation. That's why I think as an industry, we have to reconcile with what is actually happening on the ground and then this long-term look of what happens when these verdicts continue to escalate. Do we end up losing a lot more capacity because they simply can't afford the insurance? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I don't know, but we'll have to see that over the next few years. Uh, two minutes left here. Final thoughts here, because I mean, I believe optimism. This industry is slowly working out its demons. Uh, what's the lowest hanging fruit? If we need to do something, what do you think in the near term we should be paying close attention to as this stuff develops? I think the best thing to do is like, as you mentioned earlier, people are trying to say it's not the driver's fault. The truck driver is a victim just like everybody else. As an industry, we really do need to take the blocking and tackling of preventative maintenance seriously. If your out of service numbers are above the national average, like over 21.6%, you need to do a deep dive into your own reason for doing this industry because you're clearly not doing it well. And we need to be more rigorous at what we consider safe. We need to empower truck drivers who 
see unsafe conditions on their asset to be able to raise their hand and say, uh, boss, I don't feel safe driving this and, and not have them get terminated because they did this. So I think if you're looking for the optimism is we are going to be forced to do the right thing at some point. Maybe we, we we hem in our hall, we kick our heels in and say, we don't want to do the right thing, but it will have to happen. Maybe the FMCSA comes out and says, instead of doing one inspection a year, we're going to mandate two inspections a year. But these are the types of incremental changes that drive things in the right direction. And finally, I'd say we need to get comfortable with the fact that the minimum insurance is not enough. You need to have, as a motor carrier, you need to insure the risk you create, probably something closer to $2 million of liability, maybe more. But it's... It should not be $750,000. Got to do your job right before someone else makes you do it for you or charges you for it. Uh, folks want to learn more, Matt. I'm running out of time. Uh, I wish we had more time. We're going to work on that long form. Folks want to get more information, get in touch, check out what you're up to. Best way to find out. Probably uh, Twitter, Armchair, or X, they call it Armchair Abby is my my handle, or LinkedIn, Matt Leffler. Happy to see you guys. I'll be at F3 this year. I'll be at Broker Carrier. I'll be at DatCon. I'll be at Inland. I'm all over the place. Just come and say hi. Spread the good news. Matt, pleasure to have you on. We'll talk again soon. I'll look for you at F3. Speaking of F3, buy your tickets. I have a discount code. I'm selling it. I may win something. I don't know. They just told me to tell you about it.